Hey, what's up, you guys? I'm Sarah. And I'm Jordan. And welcome to Coffee, Wine, and True Crime, Woo-hoo. week three. Trace. So, should we talk about some good stuff before we get into some sad stuff? Yes. All right. I got some good news. We are up to 87 total plays. Woo-hoo. Um, We got listeners from all over the U.S. and some listeners in Canada. Love me some Canada. I really want to go to Canada. One of my favorite shows, TV shows, is based in Canada, so. What show? Trailer Park Boys. Oh, right, yeah. Such a good show. Highly recommend if you're over, like, 16. <laughs> so, yeah, that's super cool. Um, since now we're on Apple Podcasts, if you're listening on that platform, mm-hmm. if you could be super nice and tap us that five stars, or if you're mm-hmm. so inclined to write us a review, I mean... Please do. Please do. We won't say no. Yeah. Comment. Exactly. So, yeah. What are you drinking? I am drinking a brisk iced tea with lemon. That's my caffeine because it's just, it's warm out. I'm feeling like an iced tea kind of vibe, you know? Yeah. Tea, coffee, kind of same category. So, Close it's enough. fine. Mm-hmm. How about you? Um, I have a Dunkin' co- iced coffee with three creams and two French vanilla swirls. It's intense. Mm-hmm. So, should we just get right into it today? Since Yeah, do we have some things we want to talk about first? Yeah, yeah. So, it's definitely been, I think, an emotionally draining mm-hmm. week and a half, I think, for everyone. Um, yeah. But... I mean, like, the last week and a half has just been making me kind of check my, I guess, my white privilege. Mm -hmm. And, like, Um, reevaluate a lot of the things that we experience in our everyday life. Exactly. Because, like, as a white woman, we're never going to really know what the African-American community goes through on a day-to-day basis with racial prejudice. Mm -mm. Um, And we never will, no matter how educated we get on it. Yeah, um, that's why, like, I really like the quote. Um, I've seen it on Instagram, so I may get this wrong because it's just off the top of my head. But it's like, I understand that I will never understand however I stand with you or something like that. You you, you know what yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah, I really like I've that, seen that quote. Too. So, but, I mean, I've been reading, educating myself this last mm-hmm. week. I've been studying petitions. Um, mm-hmm. Me too. Doing what I can. Um, so hopefully, like, that will spark some change. I encourage everyone, if you can, to go down and go protest if you feel safe. Um, donate money if you can. I would. I just don't have any money. Yeah. Um, since I'm living off my savings. Or even just, like, open, and it doesn't have to be necessarily some big thing. Like, I know there's a lot of pressure right now to, like, make it all about social media or, like, if you don't say anything, then it's, like, a big issue. And it's just, you know, just think to yourself, evaluate with yourself what you've experienced, what you, you know, what other people are experiencing and maybe open up a conversation with like your close family and friends about the state of the world and what's going on and how we can behave better in the future. Exactly. I mean, we're never, you know, the ones that we should be listening to are the people who go through this on a daily basis and not, you know, white people um who don't have never experienced that kind of racial prejudice against them so Mm -hmm. yeah I just felt like we needed to say something because um it would have been wrong if we didn't we would yeah it would have been wrong if we didn't address it so and all of our best thoughts go out to the family and friends of George Floyd and everyone in that community who's suffering obviously all our all our thoughts and prayers are going toward them right now because you know it's sometimes when things get so crazy it's not about the victim anymore and I want to just kind of readjust the focus to you know the actual victim and what really happened hopefully this will get some other case other cases that need to be re-examined re-examined like Breonna Breonna Taylor so hopefully, hopefully this will all, this will all spark change, positive change for our future. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, get, my, get myself resituated now, moving forward. All right, are we good to start into our cases or do you have anything else you want to talk about? 
no, I think I'm good if you want to start first since I went first last week. Okay, yeah. So we threw up a poll on Twitter about... I, I which, voted in it. I voted in it too, even though it was my case. What's, <laughs> what Did you vote for Florida? No. What, what did you vote for? The one that the state... Oh, the one I'm doing. I voted for California. No. Brittany wanted, Brittany voted for Florida because she wanted me to do a Florida man story. I want to do a Florida man story. That's okay. why I did not vote for it. Okay, you can have Florida. Yes. So this week I'm doing Hawaii. Yay. Yay. All right, so my case this week is the Honolulu Strangler. Ooh. So I just want to thank Apocalypse in Review podcast for this recommendation. Um, so just some general facts about um, this case. It's unsolved. Ooh. Yes. Finally doing an unsolved one. So that's why it's all along. Um, mm. It's the first Hawaiian serial killer. Okay. Um, the crimes took place within a year, within a year. So it's 19, from 1985 to 1986, where he murdered five women. When did Hawaii become a state? Let me Google this. I want to say the 50s. No, the 40s, I think. So I think it was before World War II. Okay, yeah. Just thinking, like, chronologically, like, if it's the first serial killer, like, in comparison to, like, the East Coast, Hawaii hasn't been a state for as long. Right, yeah. So it would be... Yeah, 1959. Okay. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to go through the timeline by going by going through the victims and then uh, the police investigation, okay. like after he did his last killing. Okay. So the first victim was Vicki Gail Purdy. She was 25 when she was killed. Um, just some background on her. She was a military wife. Uh, married to Gary Purdy, who was an Army helicopter pilot. Oh. Um, her husband said that she was not a woman to be messed with and very strong and streetwise. And uh-huh. according to her brother, she was outgoing and like had a fast-paced lifestyle. And her marriage with Gary was good, and she was described as the backbone of her family. Okay. So just an overall really good uh, woman. And a necessity, like a needed member of her family. Exactly. Not that anyone isn't a needed member of their family, but like, <laughs> like I just took myself a hole. <laughs> On May 29th, 1985, Vicky was out nightclubbing with her friends in Waikiki, which was like not unusual for her to do. Mm-hmm. Um, when she failed to return home, her husband reported her missing the next day. Okay. So... The police, like, immediately jump on trying to find her. So, like, they found her body. They, they essentially found, like, her body the day after she was murdered on May 30th. She was last seen getting into a taxi at the club, who then dropped her off at the Shorebird Hotel where her car was parked. She was last seen at the hotel at 12 a.m., and her um, car was found in the parking lot. Okay. So her body was later found um, on May 30th, so the day after she was likely um, taken and murdered, on the embankment of the Kihi Lagoon, um, which I looked at a map. It's right next to the um, Honolulu International Airport, which we'll come into play a little later. Ah, okay. Um, She was found just wearing her yellow jumpsuit from the night before. Her hands were tied behind her back, and it was later examined that she was raped and murdered. Um, And the rope to bind her was a parachute rope. Oh, my God. So she worked at a video rental store that um, dealt also pornographic movies. So her husband thought that it might, her murder might be related to um, where she worked. Um, Like it was some... I guess, creep who um, rented porn and some, you know, killed her. Um, they also, yeah. he also thought that because two women were stabbed inside the same store a year before in 1984. Okay. But this amounted to nothing, and then the case went cold. Yeah, if the circumstances are different, just because it was in the same place doesn't mean they aren't inherently connected. 
Exactly. Um, so the next victim um, was Regina Sakamoto. Um, she was 17. Oh, my God. Yeah. So on January 14th, 1986, a few months later after Vicky, um, she was reported missing um, after she um, did not go, like, not turn up for high school. So okay. the last time anyone heard from her was um, her boyfriend at 7.15 on January 14th to tell him that she would be late to school because she missed her bus. Um, she was characterized as someone who was very pretty, dark hair with a big smile. She was shy, but extremely friendly and was really close to her mom. So okay. her body was found. The next day, on January 15th, 1986, also at Kihi Lagoon, she was wearing a blue tank top and a sweatshirt, but was nude from the waist down. She was also raped and strangled with her hands tied behind her back. Jesus. Oh, my God. That's really, really bad. So, at this point, the police, that, the police suspect it's the same killer as Vicky's because of the M.O. Mm-hmm. The next murder happened only about a week and a half later. Mm-hmm. The third victim is Denise Hughes, 21. So she was a secretary for a telephone company. She was active in her church, and she was said to always have a smile on her face. So yeah. she was um, reported missing after not showing up for work on January 30th, 1986. And she was last seen having dinner with her husband, who was stationed on um, a ship in Pearl Harbor on January 29th. Dang, these girls were married young. Yeah, I mean, military. Yeah, and it was a different time. It's just funny yeah. to think about, like, I do not feel like I could be married right now. Exactly. Sure. Me either. So her body was found a few days later on February 1st by some fishermen in the Monatula stream. Her body was wrapped in like one of those blue plastic tarps Mm -hmm. that construction workers use and her body was decomposed okay Um, so water is definitely a theme here yeah like bodies of water Mm -hmm. and she was still wearing the same blue dress she was last seen in there were marks on her hands from where she was tied up and yet again she was raped and strength so at this point like i said before the police know that they have a serial killer on their hands so they establish a 27-man task force on February 5th, and the task force also got help from the FBI and the Green River Task Force um, up in Washington, who was hunting the Green River Killer at the same time. Okay. About a month and a half later, the next victim is Luis Medrios, who was 25. Okay, so she was from the Honolulu area, but she was in Kauai. Kauai? Kauai? I think it's Kauai. Kauai, okay. So she was from the Honolulu area, um, but she was in Kauai to meet her extended family after her mother died. She took a flight back to inter- the Honolulu International Airport on March 26, 1986, and like just disappeared. Um, the police think that she disappeared from the bus station near the airport as she was, that's the way she was getting home. And she was three months pregnant and was a single mom of two kids. Her um, body was found on April 2nd in the Wakili stream under an overpass by a road paving crew. Her hands were tied behind her back and was nude from the waist down, sexually assaulted, and strangled. So, like I said before, the the Keeley Lagoon was right next to the airport. So, he's kind of um, working within that area. Yeah, and has the ability to get make a quick getaway if he needed to. Mm-hmm. So at this point, the police decide that it's best to start a sting operation. So they used undercover policewomen to hang around the Keeley Lagoon as well as the Honolulu International Airport to see if maybe they could try to, I guess, get abducted. Because mm-hmm. um, he's abducting white women. Yeah. The operation failed and the final victim was found a month later so the last victim victim number five is linda pesci pesci and she was 36 
So a little bit older than the other victims. Yeah. She was um, reported missing by her roommate um, on April 30th, 1986, as she did not come home from work the previous day. She was characterized as carefree, streetwise, and a, like, knockout beauty, and she had one daughter. Okay. The police found her car parked near the Nimitz Highway near the airport, like, on, parked, like, on the side of the road, like, she broke down. Mm. A few days later, a man who was a mechanic, and I do have the name for this guy, but his name was only out by, like, one or two sources, so I didn't feel comfortable um, reporting his name. So we're okay. just going to call him the mechanic. Okay. <laughs> the, like, the guy who was the mechanic, he was 43, and he contacted the police and said a psychic told him where Linda's body was. He okay. led the, yeah, another psychic. Hmm. Like my first case. Yeah. So he led the police to Sand Island, but he did not tell them where the body was, even though, like, he knew. But he told, the, like, he was, like, totally staying away from this one area. And then when the police, like, when he left, the police went back to that area and found her body, like, in the area he was trying to get them to avoid. Then why did you call them in the first place and bring them to that area? No clue. It's like somebody who wants to get caught. Yeah, so she was nude, like, there's a concrete block on top of her, and her hands were behind, were bound behind her back, and she'd been raped and strangled. Okay. So after she was found, the police set up roadblocks on the, um, high, on the highway her car was found to question commuters, and there were a few witnesses. So one witness, a few witnesses remembered seeing Glenda's car, with flashers on around 7 p.m. So, like I said before, it was likely her car was broken down. Mm -hmm. And um, witnesses also said they saw a light-colored cargo van parked near Linda's car when it was parked on the side of the road, on the side of the road, and described the driver as white or mixed race, me uh, a man, medium build in his late 30s. Okay. The FBI Behavioral Science Unit. Um, yes. Our favorites our favorites, um, created a profile on the killers. He was in his 30s or 40s, Caucasian or mixed race, saying the killer was opp opportunistic but organized because he left very little evidence and lives or works in the area between Sand Island and like around the airport. Okay. They said he was having problems with his girlfriend or wife and had a clear, cl uh, no criminal background. Okay. So the mechanic fit the description by the witnesses and the FBI profile. Mm -hmm. He drove the same van for work that the um, witnesses saw. See? And he, like I said, he fixed the profile. He yeah. had relationship issues. And his ex-wife and girlfriend told police that he's into bondage, specifically tying hands behind the back. Wow. Yeah. And the girlfriend said on the night of all five murders... They had gotten into fights, and he stormed out of the house. Hmm. After that, so the police have some pretty good circumstantial evidence. Yeah. So the police um, began to surveil, um, put surveillance on him. Okay. So then the police bring him, bring him in for questioning about Linda's murder. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, he won't speak at all. He sits there all day and refuses to talk to police. Okay. Eventually, he agrees for a, to a polygraph, but he failed. Wow, shocker. I know. And then he gets a lawyer and refuses to talk. Um, like I said before, all the evidence is circumstantial. Yeah. So the police go to the DA, and he refuses to try the case because he said they couldn't win with this evidence. Yeah, you, you really can't. So the interesting thing is that um, they had DNA from the rape. Okay. And... But at that time in the 80s, it wasn't, you couldn't test it against someone. I guess you couldn't test it against someone else's for a DNA match. Mm -hmm. So they had DNA, but it's just never been, they couldn't test it. Yeah. So they have, I mean, they have tangible evidence, but they just can't do anything with it because of the times. They have to let him go, but they keep surveillance on him. Okay, good. So a few months later, a woman came forward as a witness where she said she saw a man helping Linda with her car on the side of the road. And then, so they do a lineup. 
Mm -hmm. And she picks the mechanic out of the lineup. Okay. Good. And she refuses, but she refuses to testify because she's scared and thinks he'll kill her. Oh my god. So, the mechanic moves to the Midwest, so the local police and FBI continue to conduct surveillance on him for years and years Mm -hmm. while he moves around the U.S. Um, Never got anything on him. He died in 2003. My gosh. So, the Honolulu police still have his, um, still has the DNA, and um, in 2017, they said they want to try to test it, but they're unclear of the quality of the DNA. Since yeah. it's been sitting there since the 80s, mm-hmm. I guess now they still haven't they still haven't um, tested it. That's it. Damn. <laughs> I, so I mean, it's, it's unsolved, pre- but it's solved. Solved exactly. Like it's pretty. I think it's pretty likely that the mechanic did it because after. I mean, I think the killings would have kept going on if it wasn't him. But the FBI or the police and the FBI just had surveillance on him. So he stopped. So yeah, so he stopped. So I think it's pretty likely that it was him. But they never even would have like had him on their radar if he hadn't gone out of his way to get their attention onto him. Yeah, but I mean, you notice other serial killers have done that too. Yeah, like, no, I get BTK, it. Son of Sam. I get why he would do it. Like when you're that twisted, anything kind of goes. But it just defeats the purpose of what you're doing. Not that like I support what he was doing, but like. <laughs> Yeah, if you're yeah, like think that they, way. yeah. I mean, honestly, they wouldn't. He would have probably never been caught and could have kept, kept killing if he didn't get involved. But. Mm-hmm. but that's what happened. They get like they get in these vibes where they're going and they're doing well, and like no one's detecting them. So then they get cocky and their ego goes up, and they like are oh, let me get involved and stick my neck in just to fuck with them, and then exactly. it just makes him look even more suspicious. <laughs> exactly. So I and I also doubt there was no psychic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, my sources were this book was a book called Honolulu Homicide, True, Honolulu Homicide, True Crime Database.com, The Star Bulletin Newspaper, ser- Serial Killer, Serial Dispatchers, Wikipedia, and then my favorite murder podcast. Um, Karen talked about it, so I listened to her too. Oh, cool. So, that's that. So You're thanks cool. for the recommendation. It was a really interesting case, and I'm glad I got to talk more kind of about and find more out about the victims than I have in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm glad I got to talk about the victims a lot. Yeah, it's cool that you had the information out there Yeah, for them. In my case, there is not. I don't even have victim names. Like, I don't wow. have anything. And there's, it, it makes more sense as I get into it, but yeah. So before I start, to all my American Horror Story fellow watchers and friends, I know Sarah is not one. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to explain a little bit to me. It, it's, but there's a, so there's a connection with this case to season six of American Horror Story, which is called Roanoke. And I'll get into like how it's connected once we get into it. Um, but this is the case of the Lethal Lovers. Ooh. Dawn. And it takes place in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay. And it involves Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood. Gwendolyn Graham was born on August 6th, 1963, and Kathy Wood was born on March 7th, 1962. Um, I couldn't find much on their early lives, but I know that they met um, when Gwendolyn moved to Michigan and started working at Alpine Manor as um, like, an, like a nurse's assistant because uh, it was an elderly person's home. And they became friends. And by 1986, their relationship had turned romantic. Ooh. Yes. So all of the accounts of everything involving the details of the crimes here from here toward like the end are going to come from Wood only. Okay. So she's um, the only one that talked. Yeah. And I'll explain like, I'll explain the crimes and then I'll explain like how it, what actually happened came to light and like how they got caught but getting into the case um so the first victim was an elderly woman who had alzheimer's who was killed in 1987 so just a year after their romantic relationship started um from being smothered by graham while uh, wood watched or kept kept guard um and since the death appeared natural nothing was deemed out of the ordinary 
in the coming months, according to Woods, Graham killed more than four patients between the ages of 65 and uh, 97 years old who all either had Alzheimer's or were incapacitated in some way. So she was like an angel of death, I think is what they call them. Yeah, basically. Um, And the reasoning behind this is so weird. Um, So they would pick their victims based off the first letter, like their initials basically, and would try to spell the word murder with those letters. So like- Oh, so like, was the first victim like- Like Mary or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then this is where like the American Horror Story connection comes in. So Roanoke is like this young couple, it's like a documentary reenacting this young couple who had moved to this house in, Roanoke, North Carolina. Oh, I was about to say Virginia, but then you didn't say Virginia, so I'm kind of happy. Right. And then uh, they, like, see all these ghosts and have all this crazy stuff happen from, like, the people who had lived in the house previously. Mm -hmm. And one of the people who had lived in the house were these two nurses who would kill elderly people and try to spell murder with them. Okay. But, like, it's fictionalized from a different state, so, like, it ended differently and like what happened in the show is different but like I thought that was a cool connection because I'm a big American Horror Story fan. I might actually have to watch that season because that season kind of sounds up my alley. Honestly for all my American Horror Story people Roanoke is not the season you want to watch. Okay what is the season I want to watch? Um all of them. Okay well my dad's almost done with Freak Show so right is that what it's called Freak Show? Yeah. So maybe I'll watch the next season with him. I like Murder House, Coven, Hotel. A lot of people either love or hate Roanoke. I think it's okay. Um, What's the next one? Cult is good. Apocalypse is really good. And then 1984 is okay. Is Is 1984 based off George Orwell's book? No, I don't think so. Okay, I was just wondering. I haven't read the book, though, so I could be wrong. The season's about, like, a summer camp in the 80s. Never mind. Um, so then, so then they go out of their way to like start murdering these people based on their first initials. And the reason they do this is because they think that it solidifies their bond and their love. And like, since they've helped murder somebody together, they have that connecting each other for forever. And like, they have that secret that keeps them together for forever, basically. So Hmm. like super insane. But there could Um, be other things that could solidify your love. Yeah, I mean, well, it's in the 80s, so, it, like, marriage wasn't a thing, and I'm sure, like, True. having to be but murder as a should, homosexual, but... Murder should never be a thing. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's not an excuse for murder. Um, so then, get this, spelling out murder was too hard for them, so they gave up and just would refer to their victims as days. So at the end of their crimes, they would basically, like, after all their victims, uh, it would be like, I love you forever and five days. Okay. Which is, like, just so weird. And, like, the days would be when they would kill them, or? No, like. Oh, they just, they would just pick some. Five days, as in, like, five victims. Oh, okay. Because spelling murder was too difficult. So they didn't even, like, fully do it. They just gave up. (laughs) So, um, these crimes happened, and that was in, like, 87-ish, and it happened pretty frequently, like, all within kind of a short period of time. So then, in 1988, Wood's ex-husband came forward with information saying, like, hey, my ex-wife told me about all this crazy stuff that happened. You need to know about this. And then they brought Woods in for questioning, and that's when she told them everything that we know now. And her perspective um, was that like portrayed Graham as being emotionally, physically, and sexually dominant in their relationship and kind of pinpointed Graham as like the mastermind of everything. Okay. Um, so then after this information came to light, two bodies were exhumed um, and examined by the medical examiner uh, to determine whether or not it was a homicide. Um, and even though it was unclear, which is pretty common in cases of smothering, mm-hmm. um, the <laughs> I love this the medical examiner decided to rule them both as homicides anyways. Ooh, love it. He's like, mm, mm-hmm. take into account everything else. Yeah, for seriously. Um, so then they, on December 4th through 5th in 1988, they were both arrested and charged with the two murders. 
Woods got a plea bargain um, in exchange for a reduced sentence for okay. testifying against Graham and kind of revealing everything that we now know. Um, so Graham testified that it was all a mind game by Woods, but then was rebutted by her new Graham was by Graham's new girlfriend, stating that she had admitted to her new girlfriend about the five murders. Okay, so everything Woods said is true. Basically, like, that we know from what love, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so on December 3rd, 1989, or November 3rd, 1989, um, Graham was found guilty of five counts of murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder and got five life sentences and is housed at Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Pittsfield Charter Township, Michigan. Oh, wow. Wood was charged with only one count of second-degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. She was sentenced to 20 years uh, for both counts and uh, was up for parole in as of March 2nd, 2005. Uh, she was incarcerated at Federal Correctional Institution Tallahassee in Florida, which is minimum security, and then she was actually released in January 2020. And oh, dang. So she was just, just released. Mm -hmm. and is supposedly living in uh, South Carolina, which has some people uh, scared about whether or not uh, she would kind of kill again. Okay, but uh, she's what at this point? like A lot old. older. Yeah. So, so before we go any further, I do just want to uh, thank my sources. I believe it was good old Wikipedia, the Odyssey Online, it was either People or People Magazine uh, was another one that I got info from. So big thank you to all them. But yeah, I don't think at this point this lady is about to, about to try to kill more people after, <laughs> after all that she's gone through. But it's also like the reasoning behind it, like thinking that, that like killing people together would solidify their bond and their love. Like that's so whack. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought angel of death cases were like always super interesting just like that you know you're being hired and you're expected to help people then you go ahead and kill them yeah people's loved ones like the most vulnerable members of a population other than babies yeah like for age wise at least yeah yeah like i've i've seen like other angel of death um murderers have like said that they they think they're helping them that was one of the things. Is yeah. she, one of the th her lines was the first time she was like, she's not suffering anymore, but like, that's not your decision. Yeah, exactly. So I think the psychology behind it is really interesting. Yeah. And there's definitely something really off there with these, with the reasoning behind why they did that. Oh, 100%. Um, and yeah, I couldn't find anything on the victim's names. I would assume that it's because they were elderly and that mm -hmm. they probably, you know, before social media and everything, that information has probably just been lost and the families just want to mourn and grieve in peace, and I respect that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so not to glorify these actions, like minimize the victims, I just couldn't find anything and didn't want to <laughs> search too deep or expose, like say people's names if they didn't want their names said kind of thing, so. Exactly. But yeah, well, for Michigan. Yeah. So six states in. Woohoo. Woo. Was that 44 more to go? No. Yeah. 46? There's 50, no, there's 50 states. I don't know why I thought there was 52. I'm stupid. Someone didn't pass the civics. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you have going on this week? Nothing much. Just work and work. Dealing, yeah. Trying not to get sunburned. What about you? Uh, my MRI on my knee on Thursday that we thought was last Thursday. Or, Very yeah. fun. So we'll see if what comes out of it. They're thinking it's just a ligament sprain mm -hmm. but we just want to make sure just with my injury history yeah so, i'm starting Hopefully to have dreams of, yeah I'm starting to have dreams of me getting hurt i had a dream last night that i got a really bad concussion it's that's how good that's really it's bad so on brand that's really bad <laughs> but it's so on brand that is that is very on brand all right well as always thank you, you for listening yeah, thank you for listening. And you can follow us on Twitter at CWATC Podcast. And on Instagram, I have coffee wine, at Coffee Wine and True Crime Podcast. Um, tap those stars on Apple Podcasts. We'd really appreciate it. Yes. All right.
Thanks for listening. Thanks. Have a good one.